The Dramatists Guild is the National Association of Playwrights, Composers, Lyricists, and Librettists. For the first time in a generation, our industry is undergoing a tectonic shift. If you're not a member, join today. Learn more at our website. Hello, and uh, welcome to our second. <laughs> it's going very well. Second yeah. and <laughs> under <laughs> Dramatist Live. Uh, my name is Joey Stocks. I am the Director of Publications and Editor of The Dramatist at the Dramatist Guild of America. Uh, and I am thrilled to have uh, two Dramatist Guild Council members and uh, both uh, Publications Committee members Joining us tonight, um, Amanda Green and Christine Toy Johnson. Hi, y'all. Hi. Hey. Thank you for being here. Happy um, uh, so, um, uh, how is everything? Are you guys Are you guys okay? We're still here. That's still good. Here. Yeah. Still here. <laughs> That's yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think everything changes on a daily basis, and so the emotions are up and down, and sideways, and everywhere for everyone, right? Yeah, it's it's deadly serious, and uh, and then you know, then there's, and then there's moments of you know, levity, and and moments of being close with your family, or taking a walk with people, not people, but you know, um, taking taking a walk and uh, talking to people on Zoom. So it's it's everything. It's I mean, I'm healthy at the moment. You know, I mean, we I have all the food I need. I have my family around. So you know, yeah, but um. Yeah, it's, it's been a lot of losses so already. Yeah. So, yeah, same here. Uh, you know, I, since last week, I've been I've been uh, trying to think about all the things that um, that I could do better on this telecast, if we can call it a telecast. This thing. Um, hey, and, why not? Okay. <laughs> sure. Uh, and um, and I, I have I basically have two things, which is um, number one, I need to get better with introductions because I forget that not everybody knows everybody. Um, and, and number two, I will try to be better at fielding questions as they come in. Although we have a really full um, schedule tonight, um, I'm not sure that we're going to have a lot of space for questions, but um, I, nevertheless, I will do better. I promise I will make a better effort um, to pay attention to that. So uh, if you joined us last week and you had questions, please forgive me. I'm really, really trying to juggle a lot of things at once that I've never juggled before. So um, uh, anyway, um, I'm bound to make some more mistakes. I probably made several already. You're awesome, Joey. And your oh, jacket thanks. is fabulous. Thanks, 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 yes. thanks. Yes. I decided to pull that back out after, um, after the... Uh, um, Webinar chic. Webinar chic. That's right. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yes. I did not put on makeup, but um, I did comb my hair and uh, yes. And I did make the, the guest bed behind me. Um, <laughs> I've commandeered the guest bedroom. It's now my office. Uh, so um, uh, right here at the top of the show, um, you know, one of the things that I, I wanted to do was um, uh, bring out Jenna Crisponti, um, our director of uh, community engagement here at the Guild. Um, is Jenna on? We have about 15 people online now. Oh, there's there's Jenna. <clears throat> Hi. How are you? I think you're on mute. Oh. Hello, everyone. We hey, just Jenna. Want to give you... Hi. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Christine. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Joey. We yeah, you're welcome. Briefly to tell our members that right now we started um, a sort of telephone tree. We're calling our members. It's called hashtag call a mentor. Uh, we're asking DG members who are in a position of, uh, you know, at relative security, safety and health, if they would be interested in volunteering and calling other DG members. Um, right now, what we've been doing, because we don't actually keep member age, but all of our members who have been DG members since 1985, um, 
we're calling them right now. There's about 2,500 of our members and we're calling them and asking them if they need any help, if they need any assistance, because we know the Dramatis Guild Foundation has emergency grants available. We know the Actors Fund has um, a number of services that they can help our members find at this time. So please, if you're interested in volunteering to call other DG members, um, check your email. We sent it out to members um, around noon or so. So please um, follow up with us and we'd love to have you volunteer. Thank you, Joey. Great, thank you, Jenna. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, I, I saw several people posting on Twitter today. Um, you know, have you checked in with so-and-so and oh, I need to go and call and check on so-and-so. So that's, uh, that's a really a great thing to do. Um, so thank you, Jenna, I appreciate that. Um, I don't know about you all, but uh, are, are you spending more time than normal on social media these days? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm trying not to because it just makes me crazy. But then then you also want to make sure you're connecting with people, see how people are, and, and then right, you read, right. read horrifying things, and you want to stay up to date, but the, you don't want to go crazy. It's... Yeah, yeah, same. You know, I what, uh, I I don't, I try not to stay on social media very much because it just sucks all the time time and life right out of me. However, um, spending so much time in front of my computer, even more than I normally do, I've, I've been checking in, um, and uh, in particular on Twitter, um, and uh, every once in a while I catch something that really I find moving, um, especially uh, at, at the overwhelming generosity and love uh, of our dramatists for one another, just showing each other support in so many different ways. Um, and uh, several people are, uh, have started teaching classes, uh, playwriting classes for free online. Um, uh, I noticed uh, that Young Jean Lee um, did that. For those of you who don't know, Young Jean Lee is the, um, is the uh, made her Broadway debut with um, Straight White Men last season and, uh, and was on a, was, had a show up this season called um, We're Gonna Die which closed early uh, along with so many other shows. Hi, Young Jean. Excellent introduction, Joey, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I worked on that. Uh, let's see, Young Jean, oh, there you are. You're, now you're not on mute. Hi. Hi. Hi, so you taught, you taught a playwriting class. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, it was, um, it, uh, you know, I, I just, uh, I don't really think of a playwriting workshop as being something that that many people would be interested in, but it was just retweeted, tweeted and retweeted like all over the world. And um, uh, it turned out that the limit on my Zoom, which I used through Stanford was a thousand. And we had many more than that that tried to get in. And so it was, uh, you know, it, it was actually my first time communicating with that many people at once before. And it was pretty crazy. It was a pretty crazy experience. But um, so uh, just, I, I don't know, like it was, it, it was, it was incredible because like at the end of it, you know, I, so while it was happening, it was sort of a nightmare, you know, just because it was just so many people and so many questions and I was completely overwhelmed um, because the amount of, questions and needs were so much more than I was able to provide in, in three hours. But um, afterwards, uh, people were reaching out to me and I got tons and tons of messages. And, um, you know, it was, the workshop was about starting a new play and people told me about their new plays that they'd started. And, you know, I gave them a sort of roadmap um, to, to stay on track and to finish the plays. And so that was, that ended up being a really amazing experience. And I, you know, I decided to do that just because I was going crazy and I was on social media and just making myself insane. And I, mm -hmm. I just thought I have to do something. So it was, it was this act of self-preservation in a way that ended up really paying off for me. Yeah, that's great. Are you going to do it again? Um, you know, well, my classes are starting uh -huh. up again soon, so I'm going to be occupied with my own students, but I recorded it and I put it online and, uh, and it really, I mean, I do think that somebody could watch that start a play and find their way through that, through that, 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 that process. Um, so I don't know, I may do another one, but it was, it was so stressful. <laughs> <laughs> I 
can only imagine. <laughs> I've spent all day planning this, and there's nowhere near a thousand people who are going to be <laughs> online or or on on the screen or at anything. Um, and it's yeah, it's a lot. Um, but that's so great. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. I know that I speak on behalf of all those who 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 joined in um, in expressing gratitude. May I ask a question? Um, you said that you recorded it. Would that be available to people who might want to see it? Yes, um, it's on my, it's all over my Twitter page. So if they just go to young Jean underscore Lee, um, they'll, they'll be able to find the link and Great. anyone can watch it. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, you know, I don't know if you guys all saw this or not, but uh, the, Ralph Sevish, who's uh, the executive director of business affairs at the Guild, um, uh, was interviewed by the Hollywood Reporter um, just a couple of days ago, and it's been all all over uh, social media. And um, and one of the things that I I thought that was so interesting that people uh, ch chimed in with, um, hi Ralph, uh, chimed in with is that um, is that there were so many people who didn't understand why the Guild is not a union. And, um, and uh, you know, it's one of those stories that, that we all know, we who work at the Guild know, and, um, and it's a question that we, we field pretty often. And, um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I think that we've all discovered about working at the Guild is that um, you answer the same questions a lot. Um, and, and that is part of the gig. And uh, so anyway, I just, uh, yeah, and, and, and I, think, I think, Young Jean, am I correct? One of the things that you found very interesting, uh, I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth because I'm, I'm really going off of, uh, off of a little essay that you wrote for the Dramatist a couple of years ago, um, uh, was some research that you were doing about guilds and unions and things, am I correct? It's kind of ringing a bell. Kind of, okay. <laughs> But um, anyway, um, uh, thank you for being here, Young Jean. I do, I do appreciate your time. Uh, I know you've got another Zoom call to get, get to, so, um, so thank you for being here, and we'll see you on Twitter. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Ralph, thank you for being here. Um, I know that this question uh, comes up a lot. Um, uh, I've, I've also asked um, Doug Wright to join us today, so, uh, so that way if you, if you feel like you need a, a comrade in, um, in explaining this, you've got somebody who's well-versed. Um, for those of you who don't know, Doug Wright, of course, is the um, president of the Dramatist Guild and uh, a Pulitzer Prize winning playwright um, in his own right. So um, we're thrilled to have you here, Doug. Are, Doug, are you going to be a voice tonight only? No, I am hoping there you are. to be here <laughs> in uh, the flesh. <laughs> hey, everybody. Thank you so much to uh, Joey and to our publications committee represented today by Amanda and Christine for taking such initiative and uh, making us live today on the internet. I feel like for all of us, it's not only informative, but under the circumstances, it feels a little life-saving. Mm -hmm. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank uh, you. Joey's, Joey's uh, you know. Yep. Thank you, Joey. Oh, Good anyway. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Would you Would you tell us again oh. the the saga of uh, of why the guild is not a union? It, you don't have to go into to the full thing. There is an actual story on our website. Um, but <laughs> while you're here, I feel like Grandpa telling the I'm story. Grandpa, tell us a story. <laughs> telling the story. Um, if you go to the website and you look, go under the menu page of join, you'll see a a, a drop down menu called where is our union? <laughs> so we've gone to great pains to uh, explain this. Oh, look at that. Um, but I'm happy to, you know, provide an oral history. And Doug, you feel free to jump in. I, uh, I know you know this story pretty well too. Sure. Um, so the Guild starts in 1912 as a committee of the Authors League and eventually becomes its own thing in 1919 and establishes its first contracts in 1926. That was the beginning of the first minimum basic agreement that was negotiated between uh, the League of Producers at that time and uh, the Guild. And in it, it reserves all copyrights and it reserves all uh, approval rights and 
all the other nice things that uh, dramatists have that people who sell their copyrights don't have. Um, and that, that agreement uh, was in existence up through the 1940s, at which time we got sued uh, for an, as um, uh, claiming that our contract was an antitrust violation. That is, since we were not employees, we were owners of property, we were licensing that property, and we were fixing prices for that property ac you know, ac across competitors, uh, all of our members being thought of as competing property owners, getting together and determining what the market would be. And that's an antitrust violation. Of course, that's not what we were, um, and that's not what we are, but unfortunately, uh, in a lawsuit that went all the way up to the Supreme Court, um, it was uh, New York State Supreme Court. It was held um, that the contract um, at that time, it was a, a narrowly decided decision about that one case. So the, the, uh, the, the court did not want to issue an opinion as to whether or not it was an antitrust violation. But in that one case, it was held uh, that the contract was not valid. So as a matter of efficiency, the, the producers still wanted to have a basic agreement rather than having to negotiate one on every single show. Um, and so the, the contracts continued on and was periodically reviewed by the League and the Guild up until the 1980s, um, at which time they sued us again. And we countersued. And there was a settlement. The settlement of that lawsuit is the current Broadway contract, the APC, the Pre Production Contract. And they've refused to revisit it ever since. Um, and so that's the way the business works now. So, but in that, in that in the environment, writers are not employees. Writers are owners of property who license their property. If you look, compare that to writing for film and television, in film and TV, writers are employees. They do what's called work for hire. That is the producer, the movie studio, the TV network, own the work written by the writers. Um, and, and not only own it, but they're the legal authors of it. Um, so authors in that scenario, our employees can form a union uh, under our labor laws and, um, and collectively bargain and do all those things, but they have no ownership or control. So that was a deal that was made by the Writers Guild. The authors, um, the Dramatists Guild never made that choice, preferring to maintain ownership and control over their work for some what I think are still valid reasons, which are, if you consider how many hours and hundreds of feature films and how many thousands of hours of television are produced in the US alone, any, any given year, uh, you can be the 12th writer in a writer's room and make enough to support your family and put braces on your kids' teeth. You know all those nice things that happen when you're an employee with a union. Um, but as playwrights, as composers and lyricists, there are literally 40 buildings in America where you can make similar money. And those buildings are filled most of the time. So we're talking about a handful of writers who um, benefit from the, uh, the type of movie money that is uh, negotiable in Hollywood. Um, if we were to form a union, if we were to go back to the NLRB and, and the Department of Justice and try and get the past case law overturned, which I'm not saying is impossible, but you have to be careful what you wish for because in that scenario, we would, uh, invariably be asked to do the same thing that the writers in, in Hollywood do, which is um, do work for hire and give up the ownership and control. And because there's so much less work and so much less money 
in theater than there is in the film and television industries, um, it would simply be lower paid um, work for hire. And you would have no ownership or control. Um, and the few people who would benefit are the same few who benefit now when they're produced on Broadway. And um, it wouldn't, it wouldn't do us, it wouldn't do the vast majority of our 8,000 members um, very much good. And in fact, would do more harm than good. That's, excuse me, Ralph, that's, that's really beautifully said. And, and you just gave a brilliant play by play. I'm gonna do a little color. I, uh, I just remember, uh, we're all sitting at home watching a lot of movies. And last night, uh, David and I had the pleasure of watching Little Women, which we hadn't seen. And for those of you that saw it, I'm sure you remember the very last scene where Tracy Letts, as Joe March's publisher, is offering to pay her a little bit of an advance for yes. her novel. And then he says, I'll give you $500 for the copyright. And she says, well, what does that mean? And he says, oh, I have editorial control and I, any sequels that you wrote or uh, any characters that you can uh, decided to uh, uh, author about some more would, would be, of course, my property. And uh, she gives him a resounding no and says that she very yeah. much wants to keep the copyright. And you can hear the sort of implicit applause from the audience when she does that. And that's the same decision that dramatists have made again and again and again. And as a naive young screenwriter, when I started working in Hollywood, it shocked me to know that your name winds up on the screen as the author of a screenplay, not because you penned every word, but because an independent counsel of your peers has been on a credit committee and decided which of the 12 writers who were hired to produce that script contributed the most verbiage. And that is what determines screen credit. And to me, that's uh, certainly uh, uh, screenwriting asks you to be a craftsman. But for me, that will never be authorship because authorship requires that you have the final say over every incarnation of the material. And that's what the Guild lives to protect. Uh, that's why we have sacrificed the benefits of union membership. But that's why when we look at our plays on the shelf, we can really claim absolute authorship and that's worth it to most of us. Great, thank there. you. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. Ralph, thank you for, uh, for joining us and for, for walking us through that. Uh, it's, it's always the, uh, whenever I listen to that, I always think, God, it's such a, it's not a great scintillating story, but it's so important for us to know. I beg to differ. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Scintillating story. I'll do better next time. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Ralph, we actually have a question from online that yep. if you don't mind fielding, I would like to, um, I would like to, uh, to read for you. This is from Sherry Friedman, who is online. Um, she says, the producers who, who postponed the festival my play is in are interviewing playwrights by Zoom to put online somewhere. Uh, also, also hinting to live stream or record our plays. I'm not getting paid. Should I be paid for my work? If my work goes online, how would I be protected against piracy of my work? Those are very good questions. Um, if you go to, we have a resource page for the, the coronavirus right now. We do. Um, and on it is a statement about live streaming, about what questions you need to be concerned about, what things you should be talking about with your agent or representative, or in this case, if you don't have one, the producer directly. Um, issues like protection of, from piracy and issues like remuneration. And you know those, those are legitimate questions that need to be answered. If, if your work is being used and viewed, you're entitled to compensation. Um, so there's, in terms of um, the other unions, I mean, if the cast are, are equity uh, members, I think uh, equity has uh, created an outline for streaming. Um, I, I think you can see it on their website about you know what, what they will and will not permit at this point for their members to participate in. But from a writer's point of view, um, it's always up to you, you know, but you want to, uh, at this time, especially in an environment where you may not be getting, as an as a author, you may not be getting any benefits from the various um, packages being passed by Congress or proposed by states, you may not be entitled to unemployment insurance because you're not an employee. 
you may not be entitled, you know, you licensed property and then they chose not to produce it because the theater got closed. So the, um, the, the, the only way you can get compensation is through having productions of your work. So you really should insist on payment if you're going to, if you're going to have it done that way. How you calculate that payment? Um, I mean, there's a number of ways, depending on how they structure the live stream, you want to make sure, first of all, they're not recording it. Um, it should be an actual live stream. And that's one way to, you know, protect against uh, piracy. And it should be a password protected site that people go to where they, you know, you buy a ticket to the show, just as you would at a box office. And you can see it online in that context. Um, and then you as authors would get a, a royalty based on tickets sold, just as you would if it was in a theater. So that's one way to do it. It's not the only way to do it. It's a way that I think is of the various models I've seen, seems to me to make the most sense. Um, but I'm sure there are other ways to skin that particular cat. Great. Ralph, thank you so much for that. I really do appreciate your, your time and generosity in answering that. Um, so for anybody who needs, uh, who wants access to some of those links and resources, it's all over our website, dramatistguild.com. Make sure dramatists is plural because there's more than one of us. <laughs> I didn't get to say goodbye. Um, you're, you're still here. Oh, okay. Terry, is showing us this, Terry is showing us the screen that you will, oh. you will find this information on. Uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff there. Yeah. Great. Authors advances and the cancellations. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. That's There's also cool. a good article, I think, in the Hollywood Reporter this week, talking about the the uh, the, the plight that playwrights are in um, due to the cancellations. So I recommend that to everybody. Great. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you Thank so you. much for being here. Thanks, everybody. Good yeah, bye. You. Um, so, uh, you know, I know that uh, it would be it would be weird if we didn't um, acknowledge a uh, very recent um, turn of events. Um, we're all I feel like we're all still in mourning um, from losing Terrence McNally. Um, uh, gosh, what was it? It's just yesterday, day before. Ugh. Um, uh, Doug, I, I, I mean, it's he's one of those people for me that uh, Whose, um, whose life and career touches so many people in so many ways. Um, in particular, he was of such great importance to the Guild. Um, I, I wondered if you just talk a little bit about that. Oh, hold on. Myself, unmute myself. There we go. I'm there sorry, you. Joey, but thank you. And uh, I know uh, those of you on the Publications Committee and at uh, the Dramatist Magazine are grateful to Terrence for everything he did on behalf of the magazine, like the West Side Story uh, uh, interview that he uh, uh, was able to arrange on behalf of the magazine, as well as a host of other contributions. And it, what makes it uh, bittersweet is it was actually, uh, this year was Terrence's 50th anniversary as a member of the Dramatist Guild Council. So that's 50 years of service to the Guild. And for uh, some very critical years, he also served as vice president. Mm -hmm. And so his advocacy for his fellow playwrights was really profound. And I think a lot of times uh, we look at film and television and its enormous impact on society. And then we think that the theater is a relatively quiet voice and can't to use big words, change the world in the same way. But I think if you look at Terence's oeuvre, he proves that that is in fact not true because uh, we live in uh, the era of gay marriage. And it was Terence who uh, brought everyday gay life out of the proverbial closet who wrote about AIDS initially in plays like Love, Valor, Compassion, Andre's Mother, Corpus Christi, The Specter of AIDS and Lips Together, Teeth Apart. Uh, so many of Terence's plays dealt with the gay experience in America. And I think by populating America's stages with the kind of 
warm, human, uh, richly realized characters that we all want to spend time with in the theater. He, he took us miles from the no less groundbreaking and no less worthy work of someone like uh, Mark Crowley and the boys in the band when as a community, we were still suffering from the stigma of a lot of uh, self-hatred and self-loathing. And so uh, uh, Terence presented an alternative vision of gay life in this country. And I'm firmly convinced without him contributing to the national oeuvre, we wouldn't have uh, things like gay marriage. And of course, he also, as, as, as a real man of the arts, he wrote about theater in such a bracing and wonderful way in pieces like Masterclass about the opera, in uh, pieces like It's Only a Play. No one was better able to celebrate the arts on stage than Terence. And they often say that, you know, plays about show business are deadly, but Terence proved otherwise by writing really canonical works about a milieu that we all truly adore. Uh, on a very personal note, I'll just conclude by saying that uh, Terence was my advisor and mentor in graduate school. And he probably gave the best master class in playwriting that I've ever had. And I remember there was one student who said his play was set in Rome and the set was an archway. And Terence must have grilled that young writer for a good 30 minutes on what was the archway made of? What did it look like? What did it taste like? Where was it in town? Who walked under it? Who walked around it and why? And, and uh, he was passionate. He was at times unforgiving about the craft, but no one was more insightful and ultimately more generous. And I still uh, treasure and keep every note on every script I ever turned in for him. So on a personal note, I feel a great debt to him, but certainly I speak for the entire guild and everyone uh, who's a member uh, in thanking Terence for 50 remarkable years of service. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you know, uh, beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, really beautiful. Uh, you know, he was he was not only important um, to the Guild, but he was important to uh, the Dramatist Guild Foundation as well. Um, his his service um, seemed to know no bounds. Um, so uh, I've, I've asked Andrew Lippa to join us today. I think he made it online. Are you there, Andrew? Oh, yay. Yes, he is here. For those of you who don't know, Andrew Lippa is the president of the Dramatist Guild Foundation uh, and, um, and one of our uh, prominent um, composer and lyricists. Um, Andrew, are you, are, you, uh, are you here? You're kind of, I, I see your name. I see my name. Can you and hear me? I can hear you. Um, I thought I had my video. Oh, there's the video. Sorry. That's all right. There we are. Yay. Magic technology. Hello, everyone. Hey, Hello. Andrew. Thanks for inviting me to this wonderful chat. Yeah, thank you for being here. I, I just wondered if you'd quickly just, uh, you know, talk about uh, Terrence's work with the DGF. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Terrence was a, a valued and treasured a longstanding member of the board of the Drama Skill Foundation. And in fact, um, for people listening in, and uh, hopefully we can spread the word uh, uh, in all of the ways that the Guild spreads the word. Um, the Foundation undertook uh, a wonderful project called the Legacy Project, where we interviewed 30 uh, different writers working in the theater. Uh, we have uh, 30 volumes, hour-long films, and some of them are on YouTube uh, that you can just go watch. And one of them is Annie Baker interviewing Terrence for about an hour-long chat and you can go to YouTube and it's part of the Legacy Project, it's volume two. And uh, if you just type in Legacy Project DGF, Terrence McNally, it'll pop up. And uh, it, it just uh, is an extraordinary conversation and wonderful to hear from Terrence himself, uh, you know, his feelings about his art making. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you, thank you for mentioning that, Andrew. Um, and, and in these very strange and uncertain times, uh, I, I also asked you here to talk a little bit about um, the vital and, um, and increasingly important um, Dramatist Guild Foundation emergency grants. Absolutely. Uh, we recognize that there are so many people in our community who are in uh, great need right now. Uh, in fact, uh, our emergency grant program, which in a normal, quote unquote, normal year 
in our first quarter of the year, we will receive two emergency grant applications. Um, at this moment, uh, we've received uh, something between 40 and 45. I don't know what today's number is, um, but we surpassed 40 in the past day. Um, and that's a lot of need, and we are trying to meet that need. Last week, uh, we were uh, given by one of our board members, a relatively new board member, who uh, really wanted to help immediately, gave us $100,000 towards helping uh, for emergency grants. Uh, one of our foundational grants came in at 12500 and then we just received word of an additional grant from the Lillian Hellman Foundation uh, for $30,000. So we have almost $150,000 we didn't have a week ago uh, that we can give directly and put in the hands of needy uh, playwrights, composers, lyricists, and librettists. I want to tell our listeners and watchers on this uh, call, I'm looking at my other computer screen. If you go to dgf.org, dgf.org, and navigate uh, to the top of the page, you will see programs, and under programs is the word grants. Click on the word grants, and it will take you to the page where you can see emergency grants and apply for an emergency grant if you need one. I just spoke to our executive director today, and we're going to make that even easier by putting a COVID-19 emergency grant button on the homepage so that you don't even have to navigate through the website. But again, dgf.org, programs, then grants, and then you'll see on the right side of the grants page, emergency grants. It's a very simple application, and we uh, are very proud of the fact that um, when we receive an emergency grant application, we convene, uh, we have a whole group of volunteers who help um, go through these applications and within 48 hours we cut checks and get them into the hands of people who need them. And even in this day and age, I believe we can do things like um, uh, deposit uh, money into someone's account rather than sending checks and dealing with mail. So we can, we can get this to people very quickly who need it. So we hope um, if, if you are listening or if you know someone in our community who uh, is finding it difficult to meet their obligations right now, can't pay their bills, please, please send them to dgf.org. We are here to help. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And, um, you know, additionally, if you're somebody who, who um, isn't in need um, and is really looking to contribute a surplus of money right now, um, I, th I can think of no better place to park some of that money than, um, than by making a donation to the DGF. Uh, I think it would be really terrific. Um, as somebody who several years ago amassed a, quite a number of uh, unplanned medical bills um, and uh, the DGF was there for me and, um, and helped me out by cutting a check very quickly. That's uh, a lot. That's wonderful of you, Joey, to mention it. And I'm so glad that we could be there for you as well. And to piggyback on something that Ralph was saying and, and Doug was saying about us not being a union, we don't have a union we can go to uh, and we, don't, we can't apply for unemployment insurance as playwrights. And there are less options for us. There are other organizations, as you know, there's Actors Fund and there are other organizations in our community who want to help but we are the only organization dedicated to those of us who write plays, musicals, and operas, uh, opera libretti particularly. Um, if you are a member of our community and you need help, don't hesitate. Please apply or tell your friends, or as Joey suggested, please donate if you can. Any amount, any amount will be, will be uh, appreciated deeply, especially now. Great. Thank you again. Um, I don't have a beautiful segue for this, um, but I, <laughs> um, Amanda and Christine and I were chatting uh, yesterday, and um, and there was something that uh, that we were talking about, which is, um, are you all writing right now? Is that easy for you? Well, we were talking about how it seems like there are two extremes. There are people that are very inspired and. Um, and so I, I know that that's my coping mechanism. So I'm sort of like 
super charged and I'm writing all these different things. But then, you know, also there are friends of mine that are just like, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not able to think about anything else and um, certainly um, honor that um, response as well. So we were talking about, about that. And I know a lot of people have different, um, different uh, responses. Yeah. Yeah. Amanda, are you writing right now? Uh, I am. I, I'm, I'm uh, you know, Zooming uh, with a, a collaborator and, um, and I've said, I have no idea whether it's good or not, but <laughs> I, uh, for the couple of hours that we're t together and focusing on it, it really is, uh, it's really a bomb. You know, it's a wonderful thing to do. I, I don't know what, you know, whether it's gold or whatever, but that's not the point at this point. You know, I, I do. And, and, you know, and then there's times when I'm, you know, just sort of freaked out and I can't do anything, but um, I, I'm enjoying that, I really am. Yeah, yeah. Doug, are you, are you writing at this point? I don't know how many people on uh, Facebook or from friends got that absolutely paralyzing uh, factoid that said, uh, it was during the plague that William Shakespeare wrote King Lear. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, no pressure. No <laughs> people, right? <laughs> Uh, but I would agree with my colleagues. I mean, I, uh, some due dates on drafts haven't changed. So there's part of me that has to be a professional and get up and write. But I think, uh, I don't know if others feel this, but certainly the, the yardstick I bring to my own work is very different in this moment because I always like to ask, okay, why does the world need this play at this juncture? And am I writing about something that is uh, important or enriching or culturally significant or, or uh, uh, does it have enough ideas in it to fill the volume of space of a Broadway theater? And in the current moment, everything I'm writing about seems dwarfed by mm -hmm. present events, by what's happening right outside my own window. And so, uh, uh, as Amanda suggested, I think when I do leap into my own work right now, it's, it's uh, about escapism and about a survival mechanism, just to, to hide in the work for a while as a respite from the harsh reality of outside. Uh, but as, as both Christine and, and Amanda said, it's, it's easy some moments and then despair hits and you just have to go walk around the coffee table 50 times. <laughs> So I, you know, you, you, who can say, I mean, you know, yeah, some, sometimes you, I, I don't know, you may have to abandon what you're doing, but you, you never know. I don't know who's, it's hard to be your own yardstick if what you're doing is important or not, you know. True. Really true. Yeah. The world tells you that usually pretty resoundingly. Yeah. <laughs> yes or no. <laughs> That's right. What about you, Andrew? Well, uh, I'm, uh, I'm so inspired by what I've just heard. Uh, I've spent the past two weeks pretty anxious. I started embroidery and I, uh, I'm on my second project at the moment and uh, that is a good way to quell my anxious feelings. Um, I'd say I've done everything but write songs. So there's something about writing songs that doesn't feel like Doug was saying, I d it just doesn't quite feel meaningful to me at the moment. Like I can't quite motivate a reason to write a song, but I've been doing all the other things that are related to that, doing research into characters and working on, I have a couple of projects that aren't a theater based that are in Hollywood and I've been working on outlines and edits and notes and, um, and uh, pitches and all that kind of stuff. Uh, any opportunity to be with others, I think is something that I am embracing but when i write songs i write them alone and so that that aloneness is even harder at the moment and i yeah. think that's i think that's what it is in fact i hadn't quite thought of it until just now that that's the reason i'm not interested enough or not motivated to write write songs whereas i like the being on the call with people and and the and the taking their notes and and absorbing ideas and sharing them with others like that collaborative part of my life is really happening right now and so i'm allowing like i usually do i'm just allowing that energy to be that energy and hopefully i will settle into something a little more disciplined as as doug mentioned all of my deadlines have pushed because most of them are related to projects uh, actually going into reading or or some sort of public event and so, of course, we're not, uh, nobody can set dates realistically at the moment. So it's a little tricky. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I, I love hearing what everybody else is doing. So thanks for this, Joey. Yeah. And I must, I must uh, I'm afraid, drop off this call. So I, I wish everybody well. And I look forward to seeing you Take all care. again. Thank Bye, you. Andy. Thank you, you Andy. so much. 
Well, uh, yeah, I have not been, uh, I had a, a, a wonderful little spate of, uh, of uh, writing energy a, a couple of months ago and uh, boy, it's really just dried up right now. Um, and I, earlier today, I, I had the opportunity to talk to, and he's actually our next guest, um, uh, Nikki Silver, who uh, told me he is, he is adamantly not writing right now. Um, Nikki is joining us from London. Um, provided that we can we can patch through. I think it's all working. It looks like it's going to. For those of you who don't know, uh, Nikki Silver is the author of many plays, including Raised in Captivity and one of None my- None of them favorite. know it. None of them know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> I well, only see blackness. Do you see me actually? No, we can't see you. But Where's we the... hear you. Oh boy. Why, why I can see you, but why can you not see me? It worked earlier when we tested it. It did. I don't know. I have no idea. The host has asked you to start. Oh, all right. Oh, oh, there, there you are. Oh, there you are. <laughs> I'm exhausted because I spent all day looking for a black backdrop so I would be like Barbara Streisand at the end of Funny Girl, just white hands and a face floating in darkness. And I was unable to find one. So I see that you can see more of me than I had anticipated. What we see is terse. Oh no, it's terrible. <laughs> I've been listening. I'm still, uh, I'm still uh, taking notes on Ralph's story. Just a second, I'll be with you one second. <laughs> no, I want to make sure, is there, because there's going to be a test. Yes. And I don't want to fail the test. What was, the, you didn't ask me anything. What? <laughs> Are you writing? Yes, I'm writing my will over and over and over yes. again. I'm on draft 13M. Um, <laughs> after this debacle, I'm cutting you out. Uh, no, I am not writing anything. Uh, I have 45 minutes to think of my answer. It's, you know, cause I logged on. I was the first person here. I saw Amanda looking very serious all by herself before anyone else in the meeting. Uh, in the webinar, it's not a meeting, it's a webinar. Uh, so no, I, I, I hardly ever write anyway. I, I mean, as it turns, I don't write very often. I have a lot of plays, but it feels like I don't ever do it. Uh, you know, it's like a couple months a year. The rest of the time, um, I, I don't, I just think. So no, I'm not writing anything. I'm, I'm hoping, you know, it's like, I imagine at the beginning of World War II, I would not have been able to write like for about a year until Pearl, after Pearl Harbor. Maybe someday it will seem normal to me. But right now it feels like Pearl Harbor has just happened. And so, no, beyond, I'm writing a lot of anonymous and quite vulgar and slanderous tweets, but uh, that's about the extent of it. I thought I was logging into Chatterbait, as we discussed. I'm very disappointed, but I'd love to tip you. <laughs> so I'm out of, also, might I commend, the director is actually doing reaction shots. Uh. <laughs> I mean, it's so sophisticated. I'm very impressed. There's actual reaction shots on this webisode. <laughs> uh -oh. Yeah. I look very pale compared to you all. Look very pale. <laughs> it's, it's all about the lighting, Nikki. And also, I mean, Nikki, you, I mean, the shut in has, I mean, you, this is kind of the world has caught up to your lifestyle a little bit, right? Yes. Social distancing, I have noticed no difference at all in my <laughs> lifestyle at all. So, um, you know, it's fine with me. Uh, I do miss, uh, there are some things I miss, but mostly I, I mostly it's how I've always lived. But actually, I mean, I moved to London, which by the way, you know, we're way ahead of you in time-wise. It's actually um, Sunday here. And um, I did go out and see more people and do more things. So now it's really like I'm back in New York is what it feels like. Because really in New York, I did live like a hermit. You were giving my credits, I believe, before I interrupted. <laughs> yes, I was. I was. Do we I just was. roll the credits? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. The show had show. This the webinar had so yeah. much, so much dignity and so sense of purpose before I joined. <laughs> I feel bad. I feel quite awful about the whole thing. <laughs> well, uh, I, I personally feel vindicated somewhat to know that you're not writing because now I don't feel quite so alone um, in my. Not you are alone. Huh? 
You are alone. I you may not feel alone, but you are alone. <laughs> but I think it's true. I think it is much easier. Now, I, I, this has only occurred to me listening to the palaver of the panel. It is much easier, I do think, to find some motivation for people who work in collaborative forms, such as musicals. You know, I, I, I work alone. I live alone. I am quite certain I will, in fact, die alone. And wow. now. Yes. Maybe soon. Um, but uh, it, 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 I, I couldn't even entertain it. If I had already been writing, writing something when this happened, if I'd been in the middle of a draft of something, maybe I could have by now rallied and continued, but I was not, and so I didn't. Well, there you go. I paused. I paused now. You, you can just cut off my mic. That's what generally happens. <laughs> 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 this is the last show with Isabel Stevenson. She cut off my mic. Remember her? Wow. And that's it. This is this is the new age version. So it's your fault. It is my fault. I was also, I was, do you remember the, uh, I wrote a play and they did a reading of it at the, um, what, what's the name of the theater where they did Once Upon a Mattress in New York City? It started there. Uh, oh, oh off-Broadway, right? Yeah. What's yeah. the name of that theater? Well, they did a reading of my, they had been around for 25 years and they did a reading of a play of mine. Next day, they went out of business. They announced they were closing. I swear to God. I can't remember the name of the theater. It was quite a famous theater. They did Once Upon a Mattress. At the time, the show that was running was a thing called Two in the Hand or something about, I don't remember. But I, I, I was the death knell in that institution. Well. Oh, well, thank you for that. Okay. I'm yeah. so sorry. I'll shut up now. You can yeah. talk to Christine. You, you know, yap, 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 Christine. Well, um, <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I, don't know that I, I don't really know you. It's very, you look lovely. Oh, well, you thank you. You lovely. do too. Thank you. <laughs> nice to meet you. I'm sure it's a great thrill. <laughs> okay. Oh my gosh. Both people, both people who are not on the panel and are watching this, that's right, both. Like, who is this? that one and why is he so pale <laughs> that's what they're saying oh my goodness i have to look up on my phone where that show originated i it think was, it was the, was it the phoenix theater yes yes it was in fact the phoenix theater thank you to terry stratton who just who just texted me that answer wow. terry, someone is watching this debacle yeah, believe it or not <laughs> God. Yeah, we have a few oh, never, my name is going to be mud on grinder <laughs> On you right now. <laughs> <laughs> There's a whole niche for that, though. I've niche. never put mud on grinder. Yes, I've never actually even been on the grinder, as my generation would call it, the grinder. Yeah. Yes. Well, people. that's for a different webinar. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. Nikki, thank you for joining us today. Okay, I bye. It was a great treat. Um, now I'm going to stay on. So when you great. talk, when you say mean things about me, yeah. I'll hear it. Okay. Wait. Oh, Doug Wright has been here. He was on my, not on my. Hello, Doug. I saw. I know you. Hi. Totally. And I just, I will say, I will talk about you, Nikki, and I will uh, thank Joey for arranging this because I have to say, five minutes in your company has done more for my spirits than anything in about the last three weeks. The so. prostitutes tell me that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, because five minutes is all I can afford. And they go, that's it, you done. Thank you. That's very sweet. It's lovely to see you. You um, too. I'm uh, God you are an inspiration. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you. Nikki. Be well. Thank you. Talk about me nicely. <laughs> that was a tonic, an absolute tonic. It was. It was indeed. Um, uh, so, um, uh, Amanda, I, I just want to come back to um, this is a, a strange, another terrible segue. I'll get better at this. I was, I, I, the beginning had some had some decent segues. This is not one of them. Um, uh, we were talking earlier, and um, and I, 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 you had mentioned um, that about your relationship with Terrence McNally, um, and uh, I just wondered if you could could help help get us back into uh, that topic. Oh, yeah, I, Doug spoke about him so eloquently. We, we got to be friends. I think uh, Walter Bobby introduced us. And uh, for one dizzy moment for a few months, we were talking about doing a project together about my father and Betty. And um, I got to be friends with him and I still have, uh, we, he loved Marco Polo. 
the, um, the, the, and he would give me, he would send me these long monologues that were just so wonderful and endearing. He really just made everybody feel like they were the most important person to him and absolutely delighted him. And, and that's the way everybody felt about him. Um, and uh, yeah, but I think we have Lynn Ahrens, right? And Stephen Flaherty to talk about we him. Do, so. we do. And Matthew Lopez. Um, I was wondering if we could, um, if we could bring Stephen Flaherty in. Oh, there's okay, Lynn. Lynn. Hello, Lynn. And here comes Stephen. Um, Lynn Ahrens. Um, oh, goodness. I have not prepared. Um, oh, oh, I'm falling down, falling down right here in front of everyone. No, no, no. I, You're doing very I well. I had notes. So, uh, you know, a Lynn woman who needs here. no introduction, ladies Lynn. and gentlemen, please. That's right. <laughs> Lynn. That's right. Um, but That's but right. Lynn did send me a little a little intro here, um, uh, and I think it's important yeah. to note that um, it, that she and Stephen, both of us, yeah, that she and Stephen wrote um, three musicals with um, with Terrence: Ragtime, A Man of No Importance, and uh, Anastasia. Um, and so we're we're thrilled to have you here, Stephen. Are you joining us from Mexico? I, yeah, I'm here. I can't, I can't, I don't know how this works, right? so but I am we, here. If you can hear me. We can I hear you here. Can hear you. <laughs> we keep saying, help, help. We don't know help, what to do. Help. That's right. It's That's a brave new world and we're confused. <laughs> That's right. Um, and, and I don't know if Matthew Lopez uh, was able to log on or not, but um, Terry, if he's, if you see him, would you bring him on stage? <laughs> I don't think that's the technologically uh, correct term to use here, but that's the one I've got. Um, thank Hi, you. Hi, everybody. I see little pictures. Oh, it's so cute. Hi. <laughs> How are you, Lynn? I miss you. I'm good. I miss you, too. We're never going to see each other again. They closed the border. <laughs> last, week, last week, we were working on a show together uh, in Sarasota, Florida, having a wonderful time. And, and then all of a sudden, uh, we were shut down. We were like, headed the know, world ended the, the yeah. world ended and here we are like literally a week and a day later and it's just it's very strange i miss our little room yeah yeah Crazy. every Here's morning i wake up hi, and check matthew. my throat <laughs> hi matthew how are you hey how are you it's good to be here with you all Thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. No, it's my pleasure. Um, uh, as as we're as we're rounding out the um, the hour here <laughs> rapidly, um, not to rush you because you'll just take as much time as you want. We we don't we don't have to break for a commercial. Um, uh, I just you know we're we're all here remembering Terrence mm -hmm. and um, you know in the Dramatist magazine we will probably definitely. Uh, although we've not discussed this, I feel confident to say that we will do something a little more formal than this very informal presentation this evening. But um, I, I do thank you all for being here um, uh, and for joining us and just uh, uh, sharing sharing your thoughts uh, and uh, with us. That's it. I'll shut up. Um, Stephen, thank you for joining us from Mexico. That's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. <laughs> would, would, would you kick us off with um, with whatever you whatever you'd like to say sure um uh it's 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 been it's been a difficult week you know just two days ago we lost a great friend a great collaborator uh a wonderful man of the theater uh who i think i think everybody that has ever met terrence uh you can't go on the same way that you have been but before the meeting i think he changed uh, he changes everybody's lives i know for me certainly uh, he's made me a better writer, a better human being. You know, it's it's hard to pick any one anecdote because we we had written three shows together, and it amounted to several uh, crazy out of town, <laughs> you know, and, uh, um, situations. And and really, when you're out of town working on a musical, that's when you get to know what it is to be a writer, and you understand rewrites, and you understand uh, what it means to be uh, like a, a comrade and a friend uh, when you're in the trenches of musical comedy. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he was just an inspiration. We were lucky that the first time we got to wrote, uh, write with him was actually in a weird way, a blind date because we had auditioned to get the show and we had never uh, met the writer before. We had never met the playwright. So all of a sudden we are writing Ragtime with Terrence McNally and it was, uh, it, it was a thrill. And he just welcomed us in with open arms. And, you know, even though he had had decades more experience than we had, uh, he just 
welcomed us in fully and uh, we immediately started writing and uh, we felt like we were peers and like we were that we belonged there with him and uh, it was a tremendous experience it was like uh, running across the long distance course but sprinting you know as we did it and uh, it, it was a wonderful experience and a great uh, way to begin a relationship yeah, that's incredible. Wow, I, a, a blind date with Terrence. Yeah, that's what it was. It was a blind there, date. There's yeah. a title for you. Yeah, it turned <laughs> out well, though. <laughs> uh, Matthew, um, thank you for joining us. Um, I, we, we emailed a little bit earlier today, and, um, and I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think you've got a couple of uh, passages that you wanted to share. Yeah, I also wanted to just say that the first time, you know, when I reached out to, to Terrence, uh, many, many years ago, I'd, I'd moved to New York and I wasn't sh certain what I wanted to do with my life. And um, I, uh, I I sent a bunch of letters out to different people. I got the, I got the, the what was it called? The, um, oh, it, it escapes me. It had the, um, the a list of people's names and addresses on the back of it. Um, and um, I sent out the, all these letters and, and I got one, re I spent maybe about a hundred letters and I got one response and it was from <laughs> Hal Prince. And how Prince invited me to his office, mm -hmm. and I was just like, you know, I, you know, I, th I think I want to be a writer. I want to work in theater. And 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 he said, well, I'll tell you what. Let me give you the name of. Let me give you Terrence's number and ask him. Reach out to him. Tell him I said that you know that you should do that and and uh, offer your services as a as an assistant to him. And it was actually a workshop of Lynn and Stevens' musical with him, a uh, man of no importance. Oh. Uh, and I. I and right. you know the thing now having like I, I'm working I'm making I'm writing my my own musical right now with with uh, Mark Shaven and Scott Whitman and uh, in this uh, and we did a workshop in January and and um, you know I, I I had an assistant on that but the, the kind of assistant that the Terrence needed he didn't really need an assistant I was just there to learn and he was so generous with me um, and was you know certain to to, to ask me what I you know, I was understanding what they were doing and, and, you know, why the decisions were being made this way. And he was just so generous in a way that he didn't need to be. And I think that was, that was Terrence. Um, and over the years, we, we, we became very dear friends and he, he was a mentor to me. And, and um, it's because of Terrence that I'm a writer. It's because of Terrence that I had the courage to, to pursue a career as a writer. And um, one of my proudest moments was that he was at the opening night of my first show in New York, Whipping Man at MTC about 10 years ago. And um, and then the last time I ever saw Terrence was at the opening night of The Inheritance on Broadway. Um, and throughout those years, we stayed in touch and I got so much encouragement from him and, and love and tough love and <laughs> peaks. Uh, and he was very, you know, thing about Terrence is he was always honest and that, you know, often cut two ways. But the thing about the thing about an honest person is that that's that's really the only kind of great writer. The only kind of great writer can be an honest person. And Terrence's work was so so honest, and I think that was what made him so um, so capable of of piercing our defenses. So capable of seeing um, who we are as people. You know, Terrence Terrence, with the exception of Marie Callas, he he really didn't write about great people. He wrote about ordinary people. You know. Um, uh, Frankie and Johnny being such a great example of that, and um, he uh, he found the greatness in in ordinary people, and he found what was sort of um, he he found what was was beautiful in 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 the mundane uh, aspects of life, and you know the two the one moment of his in one of his plays that I think is just so telling as to to who he is as a writer is. Is there's a scene in in Love, Valor, Compassion where James and Buzz are, are talking and um, and and they he they they're sort of talking about their their illness and James is very sick at that point and um, Buzz um, asks if he has any lesions and James says yes I have one and um, he asks if he can see it and James is really um, sort of taken aback by it and and he shows him. And the instinct that Buzz has is he goes and he kisses the lesion. Um, and he says, you know, we've, uh, we've, we've got to make 
I don't know. It's, I remember he said something along the lines, we've got to make friends with these things because we have no choice, basically. And there was something telling about that decision of Terrence. To, you know, and I remember in scenes in like Philadelphia, they use the lesions as sort of, it's, it's a horror show, you know, and, and, and other, in other dramatic works about, about AIDS, um, the lesions were sort of these sort of portents of doom. And what Terrence did was he found beauty in them. Um, and he turned it into a place uh, of almost like a benediction, a blessing that that Buzz gives him. Um, it, it's 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 that's that's who he was as a writer. That's who he was as a person. Um, not to dominate things, but when you're ready for it, I found the perfect thing to read. It's, yes, I please. mean, there's nothing more perfect than the last paragraph of Masterclass, uh, which I think is. It's the words of Maria Callas, but it's the words of Terence McNally. It's as if I was seemed harsh, it is because I have been harsh with myself. I'm no good with words, but I tried to reach you. To communicate something of what I feel about what we do as artists, as musicians, as human beings. The sun will not fall down from the sky if there are no more traviatas. The world can and will go on without us. But I have to think that we've made this world a better place, that we left it richer, wiser that we had not chosen our way of art. The older I get, the less I know, but I am certain that what we do matters. If I didn't believe that, you must know what we want to do in life. You must decide for we cannot do everything. You cannot think singing is an easy career. It is a lifetime's work. It does not stop here. Whether I continue singing or not doesn't matter because it's all there in the recordings. Uh, it's what what matters is that you use whatever you have and you learn uh, that you learn wisely. Think of the expression of words, of good diction, of your own deep feelings. The only thanks I ask is that you sing properly and honestly. If you do this, I will feel repaid. Um, I, I think there's no better words than Terence's own words to sum up his his life and his career. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Thank you for that, Matthew. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Lynn, hi. Hi. Thank you for joining us. Yes, of course. I've been sobbing for two days, you know, and I, I wrote to Joey that I didn't know if I could, you know, make it through this, but I think I'm going to be okay, oddly, because just he hearing people talk about him is very soothing and, and emotionally um, resonant. And, um, you know, I, I, I have been trying desperately for the past, since you got in touch with me since yesterday, to think what I would say, what, what would I talk about with this man? Um, you know, his generosity, his hilarity, his brain that was so amazing and that didn't make you feel stupid, you know, which I usually do. And he didn't ever do that with me. Um, he's, his, his crankiness, his, you know, we were always butting heads, you know, two writers who were sure they were right, uh, and all of that stuff. And, you know, Matthew just said it best. He, it, it, I, I'm going to use his words because my words really pale in comparison to his. And I don't know if you all have this book. I feel like a huckster. This book <laughs> is amazing. And I had it on my shelf up here. I'm, I'm up in upstate New York and I was so thrilled that I had it because I read it and I wanted to reread it anyway. And I opened it up and I just started seeing stuff in there that I wanted to read. So I'm not going to read much, but, but the book a of passages, if that's okay. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just, and the other weird thing, this is the weirdest thing. I opened this book and I was thumbing through and remembering a lot of it. And, um, he talked about the end of love, the end of act one of love, valor, compassion. He always listened to music and stuff. And he said that he was listening to, or was thinking about the music of Knoxville 1915, mm. which is an operatic piece. Well, Stephen and I just got back from Florida crossing in midair basically with Taryn. And we were coming from doing a musical of that piece of Knoxville. It's called Knoxville. It's based on a death in the family. So that was surreal to me. And the other thing was, Stephen, did you know that he acknowledged us? No. <laughs> well, guess what he did? He's, we're in his acknowledgments. I never, I don't read, usually read them. They're just a list of names I don't oh. know. 
They're yeah. hilarious and wonderful and so far ranging. Everybody from his first grade teacher to his dog. And we're in there. I, I'm not kidding. So well, the dog did contribute a lot to those meetings. I know. Yeah. I know. So anyway, let me let me just read this for <laughs> it's just Does everybody know that his dog's name was Terry? Isn't that bizarre? Don't tell because I'm gonna read that. That he writes about what well, this is like him. This is all of him. I just love it so much. Okay, I'm just gonna read this very, very quickly. This is the first piece. I'm gonna read two little pieces. At Rise. This is how my plays begin. So shall these few words about Terence McNally, a memoir in plays. A memoir is selective memory. It's how the writer wants to be remembered. It's the whole truth and nothing but the truth, all from one unchallenged point of view. There's no prosecutor, no judge, no moral referee even. A good liar can write a good memoir. It's my life, I'll describe it and define it as I wish. A great liar will write an even better one. The truth needs massaging. That's what artists do, improve the truth and find meaning in all our yesterdays that have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Critics and scholars write biographies, sometimes lasting ones. Artists write memoirs, their side of their own story, at least as they choose to tell it. More importantly, they leave behind a body of work. The real truth about an artist is in the work and there is no getting away from the work. It all begins and ends with it. It tells more about an artist than any amount of biographical research or autobiographical self-recrimination ever will. For the moment, this anthology of plays and informational recollections of how and why some of them were written is how I choose to tell my story, some of my colleagues' stories, and how we lived and worked together in a common pursuit to tell the truth. It's a theatrical truth to be sure, but something very close to the one we all experience yet find so difficult to articulate. It can't be Googled, that's for certain. The American theater just may be the last mom and pop business in America. The movies aren't, television is, isn't. If you see a play tonight, you can be certain one person, not a corporation or a board of directors wrote it. That is theater's primal truth. To the day this is no longer true must never come. So once more unto the breach, dear friends, once more at rise. And that's the first piece. Okay. And then this is the last piece. Um, maybe mothers and sons is, now this is written in 2015. Maybe mothers and sons is my last play. I don't think so, but at 76, there's always that possibility. I have lived hard, played, the same and worked all the while. I've been ecstatically partnered, now married since 2001 to Tom Curtihy, a wonderful, wonderful man and a very good lawyer turned very good producer. I'm a lung cancer survivor. Six months after I met him, uh, uh, I told him on one of our first dates that they found a malignant tumor on my right lung, both lungs as it turned out after they opened me up. He said he'd be there for me if I'd like. I told him I thought I'd like that very much. He chose not to run, but gave me the option whether he should stay. Like me, our dog, a heartbreaker of a 14-year-old female Yorkshire Terrier named Terry, is getting older too. To say our emphatic bond is strong is putting it mildly. Tom had just gotten Terry when I met him. He insists I tell people this, lest they think I named a dog for myself. He's right, they do. I'm setting the record straight once and for all. I always tell people that a life in the theater is its own reward. It's not about celebrity or rewards. It's about doing something that can matter. It's about making yourself heard. Everything else is the cherry on the icing on the cake. Every play of mine is who I am. I am everywhere in them, but you will never find me. That's because I am every contradictory, inconsistent thing about them the good, the bad, the indecent, the boring, the trivial, the hopeful, the nihilistic, the contented, the demented, the unassuming, the control freak, the eight-year-old demanding, mommy, look at me, the 76-year-old man wondering if his third act is going to be as interesting as the first two were. I will always be all of them. Betty Davis told us old ages and for sissies. When I was a young, young man, I didn't know what she was talking about. I can tell you now, neither is theater. But at my next opening, I will deny I ever wrote that. I will be a young man all over again. I will be hopeful that this time we got it really and truly right, that I have been heard, that what I have done with my life mattered. 
as Maria says at the end of Masterclass, well, that's that. That's it. Perfect. Thank you. That's Thank our you. parents. Listen, we are out of, we are well over our time, but uh, it is, it is very much worth it, in my opinion. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. Matthew, thank you. Lynn, Stephen, Doug, thank you, thank you so much. Thanks it's for doing really this. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Amanda and Christine, thank you for doing this again. I so do appreciate you being here. Always. Um, next week, we're going to do another one, and it is the Humana Festival edition of the Dramatist Live, because I was supposed to be doing it live, not live streamed, but actually at the Humana Festival this weekend. And of course the festival has been canceled, so uh, I am not there. Um, so we're doing a makeup uh, Dramatist Live with them. Um, it's going to be uh, bittersweet. Um, the sweet part is that the playwrights and the festival were going to be able to be with us um, this next weekend. Uh oh, is that me? Am I blinking out? Am I here? You're here. You're there. Okay, yeah. right. I, I had a warning come up. Uh, uh, not all the playwrights were going to be able to be with us when we were going to be when we were going to be at, uh, in Louisville, um, because of the miracle of technology. It looks like many of them, if not all of them, will be able to join us, which is exciting. Um, the the bitter part is that no one will have seen their play. Uh, so I'm not sure how to. How to, how to navigate that, but we'll, we've got a week to figure it out. Um, and Christine Toy Johnson will be joining us um, to interview uh, their artistic director, um, Robert Barry Robert Fleming. Robert Fleming, yep. Yep. Uh, and so we're really, really happy that he's going to join us. Uh, we're still putting that together. Um, so uh, thank you. Anyway, that's what's up next week. Um, we'll be here uh, next Thursday at 5.30 again. And, um, and we hope to see you there. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Much love to you. Bye. 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 Bye.